Hello, everybody. I'm happy to be here. And particularly happy to be here with uh, Belltrex because I just heard that the founder who was sitting here was 19 years old when he started the company. And uh, the thing is, ISRO was like that when I first got to know about this uh, whole, um, you know, the, this uh, space research. I didn't know anything about it before I got married to my husband. Uh, Arvamudan. But then I discovered at that time the average age at ISRO was like 26 or 27. You know, they were all so young and they started. And I think that is a very, very important point to remember when we are dealing with uh, technology in particular. Because the young people are the ones who are tech savvy, who are also, you know, there is no, they're not jaded yet. And so there is so much that can be achieved. So anyway, to put first things first, um, I uh, met my husband in uh, 1969 and I think at that time the Space Research uh, Organization was just about six years old or something. They had uh, ho a whole uh, Aramudan and Kalam and Ishwar Das, there were six people, Murti, who is from Bangalore, and um, uh, some others, Prakash Rao and Kale, I think they were about, and Ramakrishna Rao. There were about six people who had gone, who had been handpicked by Dr. Sarabhai to go to uh, NASA to study about space research. Now, you can imagine this was very important. Today, all of us, even my youngest, granddaughter knows about space and rockets and you know um, spaceships and things those days nobody knew anything about anything and uh, Dan was working at that uh, I'll come to why he was called Dan but anyway Dan was working at that time with uh, atomic energy he had uh, got he had studied at MIT that um, Madras Institute of Technology in Chennai and uh, right through he was a first rank student so he had got into Madras Institute of Technology on merit because in those days in Chennai it was very difficult to get into engineering colleges so and nobody offered electronics engineering whereas MIT did and he it I mean MIT gave him a scholarship and then when he graduated again with the first rank from MIT he was immediately offered a job at uh, Atomic Energy. And unlike others who had to go through an internship, he was directly put as a tutor. But after about a year, he was getting very bored with it and he was just wondering what to do. He didn't like Bombay. He was wanting a way out. When he saw this advertisement, uh, which was not an advertisement, it was a notice which was sent to all the young people over there in Atomic Energy saying that Dr. Vikram Sarabhai wanted to start a space program and he wanted volunteers to join the program. So that was very exciting to him. He knew nothing about space, but he was excited at the thought of going and working at NASA. So he volunteered and so did many other people. But I mean, he was, he says he was the very first person to be chosen by Dr. Sarabhai. And his parents were very unhappy with him because he said, what is this? You, Why do you want to go and join some new, I mean, thing which is like flying kites in the sky, <laughs> you know? If you stick to your good job, you have a government job at Atomic Energy. But I'm saying that is where the youth part of it comes in. In 22, you like to think that you can do anything. You don't want to. And their family were not very well off. But... He persuaded his father that that is what he wanted to do and so they went off to NASA. So the six of them were in NASA for a while, for about a year. Some of them were there for three months or six months, but Dan spent about a year. Apparently the day he got out of the flight, uh, somebody, a taxi fellow had come to meet him and he said, what kind of name is this? I cannot pronounce it. And he looked at the last three letters and he said, from now on, you'll be known as Dan. <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, anyway, he, everybody in a, started calling him Dan. 
Now, Ara Umudan itself is a very um, a name which Tamilians uh, treasure a lot because it's a name of uh, it's a name of one of the gods of Kumbakonam. But anyway, he was known as Dan all over. So, at NASA, he says they didn't learn anything much. I mean, they had a good time looking at rockets going from play, place to place, learning basic things. But obviously, the Americans would not trust a group of young kids with all that technology. So, what they did was they learned to see how rockets were assembled from a distance. And they learned to do a countdown. He says they had a lot of fun giving a countdown to a small fireworks-like rocket and it would not go off and so on. And so, and uh, by the end of that term, most of the people had gone back. Kalam had gone back. Ishud Das and all had gone. Dan was still there. And that was the time that uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. So, it was a huge uh, thing over there. And, you know, those are all the things that he saw at that time. And then uh, by 63, he was back in India. And directly, the first thing was he was asked to go to Tumba. Uh, Tumba, as you know, is a small beach uh, at the edge of Trivandrum. And over there, uh, there were fish. it was a fishing colony. And thanks to a very, uh, I mean, Dr. Sarabhai, I think he was really a genius in handling people. He had real people skills and apart from that he also knew everyone that mattered. So that is how he was able to do this. Now, Isro, the, there was a fisherman's colony over there and that had to be moved. Why did they want that particular beach in Tumba near Trivandrum? It was because the magnetic equator pa passed over, the, over that area and the only program they had at that time was to uh, examine the magnetic equator and that sphere of uh, the atmosphere. So, um, it, they had a, it, there was a United Nations uh, agreement. It was a UN-sponsored uh, program. And people from all over the world came with their rockets to uh, launch into the magnetic equator. Now, the thing is that um, <coughs> the, the, these people who had gone to NASA and got trained and come back, they didn't really have much to do at that time because the rockets were already made and they came from all over the world and the technicians also came with them. So, the, they only had to make sure that everything was working at that time. And he, I remember Dan telling me at that time, Mr. Murthy, who was in charge, was he was uh, much older than all of them and he had worked in HL in Bangalore and all. And he told them, you know, just your job is only to launch the rocket. Just set set fire and launch the rocket. Even if they give you a jalebi to launch in the rocket, you just <laughs> launch it. It doesn't really matter because it's not our concern what goes. So they had a lot of, uh, if you read the book, uh, which I don't want to go into all the details. I mean, they had a lot of, uh, events, you know, some once the rocket just uh, went off with a bang even before they had finished the countdown. And uh, somebody asked, what happened? What was that noise? And they said, that was the rocket going off. So like that, they had a lot of uh, uh, misfires and things. But what happened was, Dr. Sarabhai, right from the beginning, he wanted to motivate these people that this is not the be-all and end-all of Israel. This is just beginning, just so that we know, we familiarize ourselves with the rockets. But we have to make our own rockets. We have to make our own fuel. We have to make our own satellites. And he said at that time, the ambition was not to set foot on the moon, though already uh, by the time Armstrong had set foot on the moon. But that was not our objective. It was to build communication satellites. It was to do... Uh, you know, research, you to build more than anything to become self-sufficient. So, what used to happen apparently was that um, he would come and he would tell, set several groups of young people working on the same uh, program, you know, so same project. Like two, three people would be working on uh, fuel, two, three people would be working on rockets. And he'd come and look at all of them and he would choose one of the better ones. 
and it was not like it was competitive and nobody felt left out because of that they would discuss and see which was the best one and they would choose and so everybody used to be very triggered and very uh, anxious to achieve so but when i first got married in 69 uh dr saraba had come on a visit and i saw for myself for the first time what an exciting thing it was like he just was first of all he was a handsome young i mean he was like in his 30s or 40s i think at the most and uh, no i think he was older than that but anyway he used to be dressed in this white salwa kurta and churidar and he would be wearing only slippers completely different from what you would expect some a scientist to be work but that was his dress and he was so casual in his dress so casual in his approach that it rubbed off on all the people in tumba and so even today if you see in vssc particularly i don't know how it is today because i left long ago but until i was there everybody from the director down to the uh, you know uh, person who's cleaning would all be wearing only very casual pants uh half sleeve shirt and uh, chappals <laughs> you know half the time in the beginning they all used to wear hawaii chappals afterwards this changed to sandals so it was like everybody was very casual and this uh, trigger of uh, sarabai was something which they all uh, they worshiped Char- sarabai almost you know because he was the one who gave them so much uh, uh freedom to do many things so you know in this uh, book also he uh, my husband has talked about you see he wrote the book but he it was all his memories i just helped because i'm a journalist and i helped him to make it easy for uh, others to read so i spent a lot of time with him talking about all the things that happened at that time he was talking about a time he went to australia uh because they had heard that Australia was scrapping one of its uh, space stations and uh, Sarah I said why don't you go down and find out if there's anything that you can pick up from there you know because if they're just scra- if they're throwing it away for scrap we can buy it from them for some very cheap uh, price and that is what we needed we don't have money so he went there and he found that that space station had already been scrapped but they said we have we are scrapping one more space station if you like we can go there so he talked about how he went there and uh, then they said yes but you will have to immediately decide and pay us so he contacted dr sarabai and sarabai being so influential was able to get the money and uh, you know help them to buy whatever was there and arrange for it to be shipped back so these things don't happen today or even at a much later date because you know all the things uh, uh you know customs and where do you get that much foreign exchange all those things came in but this was pre those days so he traveled all over the world at that time all of them all the young scientists and engineers at that time because they were uh, asked to go and look at various space stations in other places in fact soon after we got engaged he went off on a world tour to see space stations different places hawaii japan i don't know where all and uh, they got so much they learned a lot from that so this was the learning phase of isro when everybody was learning things unfortunately for me although i met dr sarabai briefly in 69 and uh, he was such a he he knew i was a journalist i and uh, he said why don't you come and join isro also you can also do writing for isro about isro and all that but uh, my husband said you know you think about it and i also wanted to think about it because i was just setting out as a journalist and a journalist working for a government organization you know my career would have come to an end so i didn't say that i i, I mean i did i before i could say anything you know my uh, the dr sarabai passed away so i think the decision was taken from my hand anyway and i also decided at that time both of us my husband and i decided that i wouldn't write about his role so because it's uh, it uh, gives a lot of uh, comments especially living in kerala so <laughs> we decided against that but 
I mean, I'm, let me go on with the story of Israel. So the uh, Tumba Beach was taken over by uh, by Israel, and the way it was done was that there was a collector over there, one Mr. Nair, and he was able to uh, talk to the fishermen and to the bishop over there, and ask if we could set up. They they asked if they could vacate the beach so that a space station could be set up. At first, obviously, there was some resistance. But once the bishop of that area was convinced that it was being done for a good thing, for the work of the nation, and that they would be given another beach where they would uh, be able to set up their fishing. And the, also the condition was they would build houses for them and a church, which was most important because they were all Christian. So... Once that was agreed to, they vacated. And the only thing they said at that time apparently was uh, that you can use the church for whatever you want, but please don't use the altar. You you do you use the rest of the church, the nave of the church, and the rest of the places. So they uh, that was the original place where Tumba started. That was the original offices where. The Tumba offices were, uh, one was in the bishop's house. The two or three Pakka buildings were there, the bishop's house, the church, and some other uh, buildings. And that's where they would uh, do some of the work. And by the time, Saraba, of course, was very active in the 60s. And he had recruited about 10 people from foreign university, uh, from foreign countries, from NASA and other places. Uh, Indians who were anxious, who had studied there and were anxious to come back and work here. So there was a set of uh, scientists who were in their 20s or 30s with who came back with their families. And the only office that they all had was a church. The church building with all the pigeons in it. And <laughs> the pigeons and their uh, whatever, <laughs> their leavings. So it was a quite a uh, change for them to come from Israel, I mean, come from USA and sit there. But everybody adjusted, and uh, soon a beautiful uh, office was built on the beach also, and offices began to come up. And also, um, the beginning, there was no uh, vehicles or anything. So they would take the bus and come all the way, which was 18 kilometers not good roads, they would come there and then nothing inside, the beach was quite huge. So what they would do is uh, use cycles to get across. Kalam didn't know how to cycle, but Kalam and my husband were very close friends, so he would take him doubles all the time. <laughs> and they would also cooperate on va various projects and all that. So there's this iconic picture of Dan and Kalam making a a rocket, I'm sorry, M making a nose cone of, uh, I think it was a, a, a payload of the rocket which was being built. Okay. And uh, this picture was taken by a famous uh, uh, photographer called Cartier Brasson, who was French. Apparently, he was also a friend of Dr. Sarabhai and he'd come to uh, take casual pictures of uh, Tumba. And uh, Dan says he didn't know wha when this picture was taken. They were both sitting in the bishop, uh, I think in front of the altar, and struggling to get this payload done. And I asked him, what was Kalam telling you at that time? He said, he said, he was saying, come on, buddy, we have to get it done soon. <laughs> so that's what they were discussing and uh, so these were the early days you know when you can see these were some pictures in NASA which uh, taken this was during the world tour this was during the NASA days and this was also during the NASA days you know the thing and this was the first rocket which went up Rohini and this is the famous church so this church uh, was very uh, uh, that itself has a history. See, this is the uh, rocket picture. So that church itself has a history, which you can read in this book. And um, so then, after this, 
after Dr. Dr. Sarabhai passed away, there was a complete change in the administration in a way because Professor Dhawan came. And Professor Dhawan also had a very good touch with the young people who, because he, he was already a professor in the Indian Institute of Science. He had worked and he had been in Caltech. In fact, I think he was in Caltech at the point when Sarabhai passed away and Indra Gandhi asked him to come. So he came and took over. I think when um, Sarabhai passed away, Dan was with him in, the, he was, uh, he had this, he used to stay in that um, uh, hotel in Kovalam. It is uh, called Halcyon Castle. It is on a cliff in Kovalam and it belonged to the royal family, I think at one time. But he, it was then a hotel and he used to s stay there and get up early in the morning and swim because that was uh, his program in Trivandrum. So that night also he had stayed there until 12 o'clock he was talking to all these people and early in the morning uh, Dan got a call from somebody saying that, you know, I think Sarabhai has passed away. He said, what nonsense. I talked to him just a few hours ago. But that's how suddenly it happened. So that happened and he went away. I mean, Sarabhai passed away and then Dr. Uh, Professor Darwin came. And he was completely different in his attitude in the sense he, he had a more scientific approach, not a casual approach. And I think this is how all organizations grow. In the beginning, it could be very you know, laid back and uh, casual and all that. But at some point of time, you need to get some uh, order into it. You need to get processes put in and so on. And with that, Professor Davan was very good. He really was able to get people together and he was accepted by everybody. And it, they were rather big shoes in which he had to fit into because Sarabhai was so beloved that, uh, I mean, in the beginning we were wondering how will people accept, but Professor Davan was equally beloved by the ISRO people and uh, things moved to a different plane altogether. Of course, by the time that infrastructure had also come up, so you cannot give the uh, credit of growing ISRO to any one person or any one or, you know, set of people. It grew organically because that phase had passed and now they had, uh, uh, you know, uh, RFF, which is uh, for, you know, uh, the, they had the RPPM, sorry, Rocket Propellant Plant, and then the VSSC. And so various organizations had come up, various things had come up to, uh, in order to, where you would be able to make our own rockets. The early rockets were very small. Whatever was made by Israel was very small. But meanwhile, the United Nations thing had moved off uh, and uh, everything was being done by uh, the Indian uh, Israel. It was slowly, it was called Indian, I don't I think, to forget when exactly it was, it was changed the name to Israel. And uh, yeah, so things began to change and that was the time when you know um, more and more people were being recruited from all over and the nice part to, at this point of time is that the people who came to join ISRO did not come from the IITs and the IIMs or IITs particularly for a very obvious reason because people who graduated from IIT especially in that time wanted to go abroad they didn't want to work for any Indian organization. So in a way, uh, their loss was our gain because ISRO got very enthusiastic young scientists and engineers from all over the uh, regional and other colleges. And they formed the backbone of ISRO. Recruitment of women also started fairly early. And uh, Dan recalled to me the time he recruited the very first woman engineer from uh, the Trivandrum Engineering College. Trivandrum, you know, in that way was uh, very uh, one step ahead of other towns, I feel. Coming from Bangalore, I found that women were much more enthusiastically going to work. Their families also encouraged them a lot. And she, so he went to this uh, Trivandrum Engineering College 
and she the first woman who came and he it was the first time he was recruiting a woman and she came and the first question he asked she fainted so <laughs> probably he says he was also ready to faint because he didn't know whether he had asked some wrong questions but she went outside got revived and came back and she stayed on and became one of the senior most uh, engineers in isro ultimately today if you see isro you see so many very senior women engineers and uh, i come to that but anyway those days so that was the thing and uh, also by the time you know the things had become so much more streamlined uh, even pace pace case had to be adjusted properly you know so that you know there's recognition of worth that there is a standard standardization there were norm normalization all that took place during professor davan's time and growth also so the first slv was launched in uh, by it was built by kalam and it was launched from sri kota and uh, it was a failure the first slv was a failure which but the thing is they learned from that though in trivandrum it had become a joke the slvs are all failures so they're all satellite i mean C- sea loving veg- vehicles <laughs> and slowly pslv became permanent sea loving vehicle and aslv became always sea loving vehicle so you know to like my sons were studying in uh, school at that time and they said ma they are making fun of appa's rockets they saying they are sea loving vehicles but the sea loving ve- vehicles taught us so much and now today pslv the permanent sea loving vehicle is one of our biggest successes you know and people from all over the world are coming to launch from that but the struggle that went into making those rockets is uh, was huge because every rocket requires so much precision engineering so much review so many you know times that uh, it has to be looked at and relooked at and uh, the failures have to be analyzed you know so so many things that go into it and that i think is was the important thing um so so, so i'll read a little bit from what he called the early li- learning experiences from around the world he said um he said that when he went to various places like uh, san francisco or uh, so we moved to jet propulsion laboratory a nasa funded facility for space technology located in pasadena near san francisco this center which had a typical university atmosphere was home to elite academic community the focus here was on state of the art work in a wide range of rocket and satellite related fields we found the academic slightly secretive since the work they were doing was classified but we did learn a lot about the importance of team work in a high tech r&d organization so you see the the learning that they got came from the side not that they were went and they, somebody said yeah welcome welcome we'll teach you how to <laughs> launch a rocket they had to learn it slowly and i think one of the biggest setbacks came at the time of um, Uh, building GSLV because at that time it, this was a cryo- cryogenic rocket and cryogenic technology was something very difficult to come by and um, the uh, pa- I mean the a contract had been signed with Russia to transfer geo uh, I mean cryogenic technology to us and already two rockets had been sent fully built rockets the next was supposed to be the uh, you know program t- teaching how to build it but by the time the cold war with russia was kind of uh, ending between usa and russia and russia was uh, kind of sinking a bit and usa turned the screws on russia and said you cannot transfer cryogenic technology to india because they might use it for making bombs and we will suffer so the cryo technology was uh, stopped at that time fortunately some two rockets had already come to india 
and after a lot of going up and down and back and forth what happened was that uh, the um, indians decided they would try and you know <coughs> deconstruct the uh, rockets they already had and try to f- see how they can build gslv rockets so that was obviously it took much more time than if they had they were if they had got the uh technology easily see for uh, china probably russia gave lot of technology and therefore they were able to you know uh, speed up their program but as far as india was concerned neither technol neither uh, china uh, neither russia nor america was able to uh, give us the technology and that that became a problem so therefore it, there was a, a a kind of blip in the whole process of building up but that also we overcame that also the isro scientists who claim and a good uh, um uh, program was achieved so the gslv uh, program has also been extremely successful meanwhile even building of satellites so satellites originally were built in the usa and the origin first few insats were built in the usa with lot of uh, our techni uh, our uh, engineers going and living in california and uh, watching i mean uh, working on the construction of the satellites but that also proved to be not very comfortable for india because you know any small problem anything they would have to go back and sometimes there would be accidents and insurance would be high there were lot of problems with that so that is when they set up the satellite building center in bangalore so all the huge satellites were being built over here after that so um then the then came the question of launching the satellites see there are like uh, Pro, uh, dr gowarikar was uh, a prince uh, was the director of uh, vssc at one time and one thing he was very fond of doing was showing a chart showing from where to where have we come you know the small nike apache rockets the small rohini rockets which were built very small ones to gslv and now much more than gslv we have towering rockets now so you know that that is how was that achieved within that period of time it was not a short period of time it is like from they started in 1962 by observing what is happening by 1970 they were starting to think of building our own rockets by 1980s i think slv pslv and i, I remember at the time when dan was the director of sea harikota there were quite a few failures you know and the important thing is is you learn to learn to learn from failures failures teach you many things you know if something doesn't go off you can always dissect it and see what happened but that has to be done with a very open mind and you be able to uh, look at it and uh, since uh, my husband was of was often called to do failure analysis he says it is the most uh, dis- de- detested jobs because most of the people do not like a person who comes and tells you what you've done wrong but that is very important you know that uh, looking at failure looking at uh, you know seeing that everything was done properly and so on so the first he has also described the first failure of slv you know over here So he says this is 10th August 1979. By the, uh, shall I, I just read this out because it, ca- it it comes out better. By the second half of the 1970s, we were on a high. We were getting ready to launch SLV-3, our first homegrown launch vehicle. We were not a battle-hardened team of professionals with scores of successful rocket and satellite missions behind us, but we were young, highly motivated, and hardworking. none of us had been part of an actual satellite launch and now we were thirsting to realize our pre-flight dreams 
There were quite a few skeptics in our midst and around us. Indians had never done such a thing on their own ever before, they said. What could a bunch of youngsters do? Besides, weren't we reinventing the wheel? But the organization and the government were solidly behind us and supported our teams morally and materially. Finally, a good five years after the date originally proposed by Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, the SLV-3 was ready and assembled for a flight on the pad at Sriharikota. Abdul Kalam, a close friend and colleague, was on tenterhooks. This was his first major project. Whenever Kalam was asked to define the success criterion of the project, he would say the very act of bringing the assembled vehicle onto the launch pad constituted 50% uh, success. He would go on to assign success percentages to various events such as the takeoff, the first stage function, second stage function and so on until the actual injection into the orbit into orbit of the satellite. Would this, our first launch, score on all counts? The launch was scheduled for the early morning and I was seated in the control room in front of a console monitoring the status of the tracking systems. Dan was always in charge of the tracking systems <laughs> and the, the team had built from scratch and installed. Senior colleagues were anxiously watching the prog progress of the countdown from behind. Kalam was at the mission director's console, busily talking on the telephone to various subsystem specialists. The countdown clock was ticking and Kalam was given the first mission director's clearance for the launch. Things were moving smoothly. The umbilical cable was pulled out and the vehicle was on its own batteries. The countdown edged towards the dramatic last 10 seconds. Right on the dot, at count zero, the first stage ignited and the vehicle majestically lifted off. Those of us involved with the launch were intent on our consoles and did not go out to see the takeoff. We heard the mighty roar of the vehicle a few seconds later. As the sound took its time to reach us, the burning of the first stage seemed normal. I was watching Kalam for some sign. Had the rocket performed well? After some time, I saw a blank and fixed expression on his face, followed by disappointment. He turned around and made a thumbs down gesture. Something had gone wrong. The vehicle went out of control and splashed into the Bay of Bengal at a distance of 560 kilometers from the coast, about five minutes of after takeoff. Our very first attempt to launch a satellite launch vehicle was a failure, although it was dubbed a partial success. So this was the first launch and this was the first failure and Kalam had often said afterwards that whenever there was a success, <coughs> Professor Darwin would attribute the success to the person, the project manager. But whenever there was a failure, he would attribute it to all of us. We, we will all take the responsibility of a failure. So that was something which gave courage to people to fail also. I mean, failure was not some, th something to be ashamed of. It was something which happened normally. And uh, so when we were in uh, Sriharikota, say, uh, I think Dan took over in 88 or something. So 89, 90 up to 95. There were a number of failures because PSLV as well as ASLV were being developed at that time. And I have seen how, I mean, people would be heartbroken because they put so much effort into building it. And failure would be due, due to some minor glitch. But I think over a period of time, they learn to harden themselves and to go back and work and work again on things until, look at PSLV now. I mean, it's really it's something tremendous and I think ASLV has been phased out I'm not sure but uh, GSLV again they're all huge successes so uh, to reach that stage it had taken a long time I remember also there was uh, there is this thing that how they went first to find Sriharikota now the Sriharikota was nothing but a, an island which was um, 
which had been ident identified because it was on the east coast and they were looking for some place on the east coast with comparatively little inhabitation around it because they wanted to launch bigger rockets from there. Sri Kota was occupied only by the Yenadi tribals at that time. There was nothing, no road. Even to get to Sri Kota was difficult because you had to cross the, uh, you know, cross a canal and reach there. And during the monsoon season, it was practically impossible to reach. So, uh, Sri Kota had to be built up from absolute scratch. You know, the the first uh, time in this book is described how the you know, they had to put uh, uh, like uh, wood and things too so that the, their jeeps wouldn't sink. And how in spite of all these people being young engineers, they could not keep pace with Sarabhai at that time who would run around and, you know, uh, be so full of enthusiasm to set it up. And he said even there, he says always I think the church had been blessing us because even over there, it was the church that they had outside the island where they had their first meeting and they, they had a meal and all that. And uh, then they see Rikota. By the time I went, of course, it was fully developed. Several directors had been there and the houses were all built. And the Yenadis, who had originally kind of uh, been uh, a little skeptical about these people coming and taking over their island were now very happy because uh, they had been, uh, they had uh, their own area and schools and they also had jobs in Israel and so on. So the community had blended well by that time. And uh, of course, now I think they are looking for one more place where even bigger rockets can be launched. And uh, I think some place in Tamil Nadu has been identified so it has to i mean this is the story of growth how you know from nothing you grow into something and then you grow into something bigger uh, there was a rocket club in trivandrum which had been started by all these young engineers when they came because they were very very bored uh, trivandrum is a small town and most of them had come from big towns like uh, you know um, Chennai or Bangalore or even, you know, Delhi, Bombay and all that. And they, they just didn't know what to do with themselves in the evenings. So one of the stories I have heard is that they would all get together and um, go for a walk around the Trivatrum because there was nothing to do. And uh, every what, whatever new release was there in Sri Kumar Theatre, they would all go and see that movie. And there was also... <laughs> certain restaurants where they would all, they were called Tumba, you know, uh, Tumba restaurants because all people would go there and eat. And apparently at that time, in the 1960s, anybody wearing a pant and walking around in Trivandrum was known as a ISRO Al because <laughs> the local people don't only wear their uh, Veshti and Mundu. So from that, when I went to Trivandrum, about uh, two, three weeks ago, I mean, it has certainly changed. Not at all the same Trivandrum that I knew. Where when I drove a car and went on the road, it was like as if it was some, I had dropped down from space because there was no no women drivers. So people would come and, Ayyo, penna, penna drive. So that is how it was in those days. Today I find women on scooters and driving on in cars and all. So it has changed. Trivandrum also has grown. Like every every place has grown. I mean, Bangalore is unrecognizable now from the Bangalore I grew up in. So, so Isro has also expanded and Trivandrum is no longer the focus of all attention. It is the earliest uh, space center and it is where major rockets are still being built. But, there, but they need input, input from so many things, including like uh, from Beltrex where, you know, thrusters are made and so many other small startups which have come up. And the originally, everything was made in situ in Israel, but now it is, that is no longer the case. It has come up. One of the questions which is constantly being asked is, how is it that when one chairman goes and another chairman comes, there is no... 
I mean, it, everything goes so smoothly. It's just like all the programs are continuing, and there is there doesn't seem to be any glitch in what is happening. So, for that, I will read to you the last chapter of this uh, book. It's called The Way We Work. The Brahmprakash Hall at Shar brims with engineers shuffling their data sheets and reports. They speak excitedly to each other about their subsystems. To a stranger, however technically advanced, their exchanges sound like Greek and Latin, riddled with acronyms and jargon. Only the assembly of 400 odd engineers can understand each other perfectly. The Mission Readiness Review. MRR is in session. We are just a few days away from a major launch campaign. Each of the engineers responsible for a particular subsystem is getting ready to go on stage and present details of the tests carried out on it. Problems, solutions, tests, last minute tweaks, everything is covered. The group is an amazing mix of veterans and greenhorns and everyone in between. Anyone who is part of the project and has something to say is there. I sit next to the chairman and senior center directors. Retired pioneers like me, who are experienced experts in certain fields, form an integral part of the MRR. To the newest recruit attending the MRR for the first time, it is a thrilling and challenging experience. As one of the senior engineers finishes his presentation, a voice from the last row raises an issue. It is a junior engineer. There is absolute silence as everyone in the room gives him a patient hearing. The engineer who is making the presentation takes notes and gives a detailed response. It really does not matter that the questionnaire is quite junior in the hierarchy. For in the hall there is absolutely absolute technical democracy and no voice is stifled. Everyone knows that many an important issue has come to light in an M MRR and at times major failures have been averted because someone raised a pertinent question. The MRR epitomizes the functioning of ISRO, where the work ethics has evolved over the years. Democracy has always been the key word. Every issue is analyzed and addressed with utmost seriousness. This in turn has yielded results which are unique and unusual in a government rich scientific department. Homi Baba, the innovator who changed the bureaucratic style of running scientific organizations, made sure that scientists determined their own policies. He also insisted that they were the administrative heads of the organizations and were answerable only to the Prime Minister. Isro under Sarabhai followed the same path with more procedural innovation suited to the unforgiving nature of space technology. Openness has been the hallmark of ISRO in all its activities. The MRR is just one example. Whether it is in the planning process or long-term goal definition, budget formulation or progress reviews, design reviews, quality and reliability assessment, recruitment or promotion of personnel, transparency has always played a vital role. Because of its strategic nature, space technology is closely guarded by its creators. ISRO therefore had to develop its own technology from scratch with a great deal of trial and error. But our results have always been open for free scrutiny, scrutiny by the public. Failures and successes in our field are splashed across the sky for all to see. Our major missions are conducted in the full glare of live media spotlight and the world can learn in real time of our success or failure. Today we are no longer a mere handful of engineers experimenting with sounding rockets. The annual budget of the organization was a few lakh of rupees in 1963. This has grown to several thousand crores. ISRO has more than, this was written about uh, almost 10 years ago. So ISRO has more than 20,000 employees. In fact, we are now seriously trying not to add to the numbers by transfer, transferring repetitive work to the industries. But more importantly, ISRO has built a strong and confident human resource pool ready to take on many more challenges. 
Advanced countries have recognized that ISRO is on par, to, par with many developed countries and the field of space, space technology. We achieved this by ourselves on a shoestring budget. The average Indian is proud of ISRO's achievements and that means a lot to us. So this is the, uh, this is the way that ISRO has always functioned. And at one time when the IT boom came up, there was a kind of uh, worry whether ISRO would be able to meet the challenge and get ISROs also, I mean, uh, get recruits also into the field. But um, it so happened that uh, people were still willing to come. Finally, I think... Uh, Partly it was because ISRO is a government organization which, orga which offers uh, certain things which private organizations do not give, like, you know, for instance, housing or, you know, medical and things, which are in uh, IT built into, that, into the pay packet, but here it comes separately. So at one point of time, I think it was Madhavan or somebody asked Dan to go and talk to the new recruits and find out if they are happy and if they are not, why they are not happy and what do they want. And what he found was they only had small uh, reasons to be unhappy. Like they said, you know, we don't have a separate computer. I don't have a separate computer to myself. I don't, you know, we are crowded into, we don't have cubicles or things like that, which things which could be taken care of easily. So... You know, it's not, Israel hasn't suffered and some of the best brains are still coming to Israel, still some of them must, and they leave. People come and people go because this, that is how it is now. There are, there are more job opportunities available and so on. But I think anybody who has worked with Israel has always, you know, thinks back to what they learnt. And that I think has been the biggest gift that Israel has been able to give to society, a learning experience, uh, an ability to work with very, very high state-of-the-art technology. And now, the way that Israel is beginning to encourage uh, small startups and private organizations to become part of the Israel family and to grow with Israel, I think that has been a very great move. So, I am looking forward to seeing the time when ISRO becomes really the the world space organization. So I think I'll end my talk with this if there's anything. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Questions? And does anybody have any questions I can answer? Uh, did uh, Sarabhai die in Trivandrum and his body was taken yeah. to yeah. Yeah. He died in Trivandrum and um, yeah, that, uh, there was a great deal of mourning in Trivandrum because he was such a beloved character over there. And uh, yeah. my, my wife used to work for MASIC, uh, microwave antenna system engineering. Okay. Then she visited uh, the dead body there in Amdam. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people from Israel went, uh, from VSSC went with Dr. Sarabhai's body to Ahmedabad. My husband stayed back because he was in charge of Tumba and somebody had to stay back in <coughs> Pune. Okay. Ahmedabad, okay. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, somebody has a question. So we always hear about stalwarts like uh, Kalam and Aramodam and stuff. And this book itself is a fantastic uh, look into the history of how it happened. But in your own words, this is not a short span of time. It is not even decades, but it decades. Yeah. Can you throw some light on how did the families and the spouses <laughs> uh, yeah. face the heat or how did they stand by their... Uh, I think most of the spouses felt that... Uh, Isro is the first wife <laughs> for their <laughs> husbands. <laughs> I must confess, I myself felt like that very often because they would go in the morning. I mean, they were really very devoted, very devoted to the work that they were do doing. And they had a very strong work ethic. But, you know, it was, I mean, many, many professions, even IT professionals, their wives feel, and 
and so the only solution is to get uh, both spouses working in his role. Then it may not be so bad because they won't. Uh, then then you know. So in uh, but you know when I was in Sri Kota, there was a different vibe over there because uh, it was an island. See in Trivandrum. Even if they didn't, the wives didn't get a job in Israel, they could work as school teachers. They could work in so many other. There were a lot of places they could work in Ahmedabad also. The uh, place was like, you know, there was so many opportunities. But Sri Kota, it was an island. And uh, many of the wives were very well qualified, highly qualified people. But they didn't have opportunity. And th so there was a lot of frustration among them because uh, their careers had come to an end. Even for the women working in Israel, often I used to find that uh, because it was, a, I mean, there are more men than women in all Israel units. And here in Sri Kota, they felt it even more. They didn't have a kind of group whom, with whom, whom they could meet and all that. So I started something called the Sri Kota Women's Association at that time in uh, 1991 or something. It was called SWA. Uh, it, it, the name came beautifully, SWAS. She has Ikota Women's Association, like SWAS's breath. And um, I had, uh, I gave a lot of thought to what should SWAS do. In the beginning, I thought it, they should look into the problems and issues women face in Sri Kota. Because while I was there, a couple of suicides also took place. But then, being the director's wife over there, I could not afford to start an organization which could open it out to trade unions which might create other problems. I mean like trade unions have a place but it could not be this if this is going to be sponsored by Sri Kota. So SWAS I said would be purely cultural organization and it would be also to help women to find their own you know whatever they want to do and all that. At that time, it was a tiny idea in my mind. I started it and then I left in 1994. And 25 years later, I was called back to Sierra Kota on Women's Day. Swas was, you know, celebrating its 25th year. And they had grown so much. They had done so many things. Uh, apart from having various kinds of classes like dance and music and things which normally you don't associate with space research. They also organized picnics. They had uh, tu tu tuition classes for kids. They were doing lots of things. The women were involved with, and it was open to all the women, working women as well as wives and uh, children also of uh, CAD Kota employees. And till today, SWAS is still doing very, very well. And, you know, the there also there has, because we had set in place um, a kind of, uh, the thing that the director's wife will usually be the chairperson of, uh, will be in charge of SWAS, but then she'll have a committee to help and all the people who are living there. And I think, I mean, I personally believe that it has helped a lot to take away the angst and the frustration of what many women used to face at that time. So that was uh, one small little thing that I did <laughs> as to in Israel. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, 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 yeah, sure, I did. <laughs> I think he's also mentioned in this book. What happened was Kalam rang us up the day he became the president. He, he knew that he was going to become the president. And obviously, he wanted to talk to my husband, but uh, I said, I want to talk to him also. And, you know, when they were both young and they were walking about on the streets of Trivandrum, they used to say that they're doing sanitary inspection because there's nothing else to do in Trivandrum. So he says they're looking at all the gutters and the, the thing do. So I asked him, Kalam, when you were in Trivandrum doing sanitary inspection along with Dan, did you ever dream that one day you're going to become president of India? So he laughed loudly and he said, if somebody told me that, I would have laughed at them. I never in my biggest, I mean, wildest dreams that thought that this day would come. We went and visited him in uh, Rashtrapati Bhavan because he released my first book, which is called Disappearing Daughters. And it's about, uh, you know, the sex selective abortion and the impact it has had. And uh, he insisted that he would 
release it in the Rashtrapati Bhavan and he insisted that we should be his guests. So we stayed there with him for two, uh, may maybe a week or so. And the way the Rashtrapati Bhavan staff praised him, <laughs> I can't. they said there is no president like him. He doesn't have a single extra need or he hasn't called any of his relatives to come and stay there. He, his life was so simple. They showed me a hook on which he would hang his shirt in the evenings. You know, he was so simple and he still listened to the radio. And uh, even one, once when his uh, relatives came, he paid for their stay. Just imagine the way the ne president who came next to him, she really kind of uh, utilized all the facilities of the <laughs> Rashtrapati Bhavan in such a big way. So the contrast was even more stark, I'm sure. But he was a very beloved president, both by the staff and by generally by the people because of his simplicity, I think, which was innate to him, you know, his uh, way he spoke and the way he moved about with people. We also had a time when we wanted to get Kalam married because he was a bachelor. <laughs> he was in his 30s. So the big conversation used to be, his, he came from Rameshwaram. So you choose a girl from Rameshwaram, we'll all make a bus and we'll come to Rameshwaram and come for, but he was not at all interested in getting married. <laughs> so that flopped. <laughs> that was one project which failed and we couldn't re re resurrect it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? So I wanted to ask you a question on, uh, you were talking a lot about failures. So how was it like uh, for people who went through all these failures? What was the mood like? And what was the mood in the house? T depended. Some people took it very emotionally. I remember Professor you are now and one of the failures he actually, he shed tears because it was the second or third time that the PSLA had failed. And uh, his wife was there with him and she took him to the room and, you know, they had to console him. Some people took it very stoically. My husband was very stoic about these things. Failure is a part to success was his continuous uh, sentence. So he didn't, but there were many people who took it very badly. And uh, naturally, you know, even Madhavan and I, I remember when P.S. Willi failed second time or something, it upsets people a lot and I think at that time if you have a I think if it helps really if you have a strong family at the back who will say you know just relax and things will become all right but that could also trigger more anxiety you know because what do you know about it what do you know what I've been through could also be the reaction and different people react in different ways is all I can say <laughs> but they finally pull through, which is the most important thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, like, being a journalist, you have seen Islo as a third person point of view. You have seen him in the inside and out and everything. So, also, you have been this uh, part of this era. And you have seen a lot of startups also. You have like, talked with them. So, maybe it's a classic question. So, what you would be giving suggestion and what you have seen that has changed and what need to be changed in future. So what, like, your point of view about it? About ISRO itself or needs yeah, to be changed? Yeah, ISRO as well as the startup, but the, like, how they have been working and how they earlier worked and now they have changed a lot. So, yeah. See, when ISRO started, ISRO itself was a startup. So, in fact, uh, one of the talks which Dan gave, they put a big board at the back saying India's first startup. Isro. It was because that's how it was like a, it was just a handful of eight people or ten people or something. And it's grown. Now startups also grew to something big. Maybe Infosys was a startup at one point of time and it then became huge. And then you get feeders to it from various and that I think is important to open yourself <coughs> and think that you cannot be the god of everything. I mean, this, fortunately, ISRO also had about 10 people who were there at that time. Startups which have only one person or two people, sometimes like uh, Baiju's and all it, sometimes it becomes a problem because, you know, they don't, the whole, they're not able to carry that 
burden and then you know borrowing money and all that so that was a different it's a different world altogether fortunately isro was a government startup so they had money coming in all the time it's not that just this government is giving money to isro right from the very start right from nehru's time and indira gandhi all of them gave i mean were funded isro well so isro was well funded they were yes they had failures but they were all always had the government support because the government realized right from the very beginning that this is something which is very important imagine today if we didn't have our communication satellites and we were still depending upon nasa or uh, russia or somebody to supply us communication satellites what kind of uh, place would we be in so but also the very beginning having connection with so many uh, foreign entities space entities also helped to build that network and to make people understand that nothing can be achieved by a single entity everything has to be networked everything you have to acknowledge whatever help you get from other people like i have been uh, though i had <laughs> decided not to write anything about isro at one point of time i was invited by isro to go to um french guiana to watch one of their launches and they said if you want you can write about it but if you don't want don't write about it so <laughs> that was also okay professor davan called me once and said why don't you write about our launches and i said because we have decided at one point of time that i won't write about it then he said call that young man of yours i want to tell him that he cannot put such rules on you i said he didn't put the rule i put the rule i decided i won't so you know that time when uh, to that was a deviation but anyway when i went to isro uh, to french guiana i saw how much all the space organizations were networked you know because they had at that time i think now french guiana is going through a tough time but at that time the aryan launch vehicle it used to be like um, uh, you know one after the other the a moment our rocket went up the next rocket was ready on the launch pad and that time uh, isro's ambition was to be like that you know like you have uh, rockets going and you can launch any number at any time we were still in a very early stage this was in 1997 i think so you know that all that is those are learning experiences which we got through being part of the international network and now we are in a totally different space and uh, all all the startups are definitely very important now because everything can't be done now by this mammoth organization called isro yeah thing is as you mentioned once that about the when we bought our satellites 1981 but it is just a addition i i went to ford aerospace and saw that first satellite in set 1a okay have you are you also associated with this uh, to some extent i am in so satellite navigation and station installation okay so these are all very scary for me <laughs> yeah. yeah okay Great, great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for. You know, <laughs> okay. I, 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 I hope it goes on because I'm trying to talk to something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think I've said everything. I don't think anybody <laughs> wants to talk to me anymore. <laughs>